any, anytime you have user generated content for your site. So Reddit ran into this problem, Quora ran into this problem, um, and we solved it basically how they did. Let's go. Daniel. Hey, man. Hey, hey. How how's it going, man? Yeah, great. Thanks for coming on. I'm doing well. <laughs> we figured it out. So, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Thanks for having me. No, no, absolutely. I appreciate yeah, it. So, as the, I said, uh, yeah. It, uh, it usually takes a few minutes, so no stress there. I think everyone's used to me just talking shit for five minutes. <laughs> <laughs> Fair enough. Yeah, no, so I really appreciate you coming on. So everyone at home, so Daniel Lawhorn, basically he's a SaaS superstar, so I'm really looking forward to you know him to, coming on today. Um, for everyone at home, if, uh, if you are watching, we'd love to hear from you. And if you're on the replay, we'd love to know you got some value from this at a later date. So if you're able to type in hashtag um, Team R that are offer replay, just so we know you got some value from this. And that way, also, you're tagged in the video. So if you have any questions later on, you know where to come to, to post those questions. So, Daniel, uh, yeah, let's get started, man. Let's, let's hear a bit about, so how did you all get started uh, with your business? Because you, you've got a few businesses going on. Is that correct? Uh, that's correct. So I've, um, I've I honestly, at this point, had more uh, failed startups than successful ones, which I'm sure a lot of people in your audience will be sympathetic with. Um, absolutely yeah i'm the same i, started, I got a list <laughs> oh, yeah. absolutely right you got the, the kind of the graveyard list right yeah um i i got kind of started with that mindset when i was about uh 12 or 13 when i started kind of mowing lawns for for i think like for local churches so i grew up uh just outside nashville tennessee and there were yeah there's like a row of churches close to where I grew up and I, I got a gig just mowing every single one of them. That's great. And when That's I realized slow. that I could go out and <laughs> knock on doors and make money, yeah, right, yeah. <laughs> that, um, that really got me thinking and, and it sort of spiraled from there. Um, ended up studying in engineering in school and um, of course, you know, everyone's paying attention to Silicon Valley so you get interested in software. Of course. Um, and 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 hardware as well. I mean, I I like building things. I like uh, constructing systems in general. And so applying that to business is just exciting for me. Yeah. And so several enterprises later, uh, here we are. Yeah. No, that's fantastic. Well, that's the thing. I mean, a lot of the time it is where we start so early and we just come to this realization that we can make money by not having to do a nine to five, and it's awesome. Um, so I remember, uh, yeah, I was absolutely about fourteen and. Um, my old man would go to auctions and buy things and then we would then go to markets uh, the day later and, and sell them at markets. Um, and that was great. Oh, nice. So it runs in the family. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So that was good. But I've, I've really, over time, I had to kind of stray away from my old man's mindset because he always had these little like dodgy businesses that would only last like, you know, six months <laughs> and then move on. And uh, I remember he did that. Right. Um, filling up ink cartridges for about 12 months <laughs> back when well, i haven't heard that one yet back when printers were like still a thing you know in, in regards to um right. not just getting like these massive ones it was like these tiny little things that you have to go to an actual store to to get refilled so you'd go to this right. wow. this old man's house just knock on his door and be like oh excuse me i'd like to get my ink cartridge refilled <laughs> i love that yeah man. i love that hustle that's awesome yeah so no that's awesome so yeah from there i mean you know the fact you came to that realization that you can mow lawns and get paid for it and then you're knocking on doors what uh what really eventually through there like through school did you then kind of keep this passion in the back of your head or was it more you let it you know kind of um die down for a little bit and then you revisited it uh what what happened there well, I got I got really lucky. So I went to um, University of Tennessee uh, in Knoxville, and the the school there had just a really solid entrepreneurial ecosystem. They right. had a lot of active campus groups. There were a lot of professors that were uh, super engaged and willing to be mentors. They had competitions where you could raise capital as a student. Um, awesome. So I raised money for a couple of ventures, like as a student in that context. Yeah. And so um, I really, you know, as soon as I got in that environment, I mean, I started learning a, a ton of a ton of different things, meeting a ton of different people. And it kind of kept me focused and, and in that space. Um, and that kind of molded. I think that's where I, I picked up some additional skills beyond kind of the hustling and started thinking about, OK, how do I scale these efforts past that? And how do I find those opportunities uh, around me and, and apply what I know and, and try to solve problems. Yeah, no, that's fantastic. That's really cool. 
Uh, Reese says, oh, I used to um, yeah, sell stuff as well, and I end up with nothing but loaded junk. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I tried, I tried flipping for a while too, the, the eBay flipping thing, and I, uh, uh, same thing. I was never able to get that, get the formula right on that. So okay. That's a tough one. Yeah, well, I used to do it back before Alibaba was like known, like before it was massive. So, you know, many, many years ago, I used to buy sunglasses. And once again, this came from my dad as well because of all these dodgy fucking businesses. <laughs> <laughs> so right. he, um, he would sell sunglasses on eBay um, but from, you know, China. And he'd sell them at like, you know, 80 bucks, 120 bucks a pop. And no one knew different. I was like, well, hang on. I'm not going to do it that far. I'll sell them for 20 bucks as replicas so you at least know they're replicas. Um, and, then, <laughs> <laughs> and then there was an instance where uh, he uh, sold a pair and the address was actually in China. So he Googled it and it was the Oakley's factory. So they're obviously doing like a quality test. <laughs> oh like, my God. Oh, these, these got damaged in the mail. I'm going to have to refund you. And then he shuts the business down. I was like, yeah, look, although I'm only doing it for 20 bucks a pop, I think I'm going to do the same. <laughs> yep. <Yeah. laughs> At so, that point, you got no one to call it quits. So yeah. Well, yeah, you don't want Mr. Oakley's knocking on your door and like, excuse me, but um, <laughs> no, no. <Nah. laughs> Yeah, but that's really cool. I mean, you know, if you're in school and they're, they're teaching you how or, you know, with, with the ecosystem you're in, they're teaching you how to, like, raise capital and things like that. That's awesome. Like, here in Adelaide, there's really, especially at a younger age, there's no culture for that at all. So it's really just self-learned experience. Wow. So, yeah, that's, that's actually awesome that, uh, yeah, you were able to learn that in a structured environment, which is really cool. Yeah. So, Definitely. So, well, and that has yeah. its, its benefits of its own, too, when you, you know, when you have to learn it yourself because you don't, you know, get stuck with frameworks other people came up with. You don't necessarily learn their mistakes, which granted, you don't learn their wisdom either, but um, I, there's, a, there's a huge benefit to being self-taught with a lot of this. Yeah, I have found like with, with it though, I mean, yeah, I mean, certainly from, from someone that's, you know, done it all on their own. Uh, I had a coffee with someone a little while ago because they were doing a case study in regards to the entrepreneurship within or the entrepreneurial space within Adelaide. And he's like, oh, here's the framework that we have for startups in regards to the different, um, you know, places you can go. And he's like, have you been to any of these? And I was like, not, like, not one. And he's like, oh, well, all right, well, you're kind of the, the perfect person to have a coffee with then because you really want to learn about the eco space outside of this framework. Um, and it's good, but right. it's taken a lot longer for me to really learn that in regards to, you know, if, if you do learn from someone else, because I've always tried to be innovative, which... I've, I'm slowly learning is that it's a very expensive way to go. Um, <laughs> yeah, it is. You know, especially it very getting, much is. Yeah, especially if you're not getting like, you know, funding and that sort of thing. So if you are in essence, mm -hmm. you know, you're trying to reinvent the wheel, it, it's not really, a, a, you know, if, if you're copying a framework that's been done before, it can still be very lucrative. So I'm starting to now apply that um, more than anything. Um, but then in saying that, I say that, and then this podcast, I don't know anyone else is doing like a daily video Facebook live podcast. So. Right. <laughs> so well, that's, well, that's smart. You're, you're recognizing where you can afford to put those risks. The great thing about something like this is, you know, it doesn't take a tremendous amount of capital. You just pull out your smartphone and start talking. Yeah, it's great. Um, <laughs> and so you can take those risks with something like this, right? Yeah, um, exactly. So I think that's, you know, wherever it's capital intensive, you know, wait until you've got excess cash flow to throw away. On, on experimentation, anything that's anything that if the, if the level of risk would wipe you out, for example, or only give you a couple shots, you know, keep that as as standard and as safe as you can, and then focus on innovating on areas where you can afford to lose. And in this case, I mean, you know, no, you're not out anything yeah. uh, with this experiment. So exactly. I, you know, I think that's the absolutely the smart approach. Yeah, definitely. Because uh, the last one I had was I didn't validate the market properly. I dropped forty k. <laughs> I was like, Oh no, <laughs> I haven't made much. Oh, money. that hurts. <laughs> right. Yeah. So it's just like fuck. <laughs> but it's 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 all a part of the learning curve, you know. I mean, one day it'll be like oh, 40, 40 grand. It's like whatever, like. <laughs> but until then, I'm exactly. like, oh, I need new socks. <laughs> hey, 40, <laughs> well, hey, forty grand of learning, you know. That's how I look at it. Yeah. Well, that's it. You know, it's it's all you're paying for. A, experiences and you're paying to learn and, and uh, you know, Piru's business that, you know, in regards to importing foods, that was say 10K of a loss, but it was more of a 10K learning experience. So, you know, you always kind of look at it that way. Exactly. More than anything. So it's, it's been good, but it's, it's been a, an interesting road. <laughs> yeah. I, oh, I, I believe it. <laughs> yeah. So um, 
Yeah, so with uh, you've got a Chicago-based um, uh, venture shop, is that right, Daniel? What's uh, what's the go with that? Yes. Yeah. Um, so I, um, I so based out of Chicago, and I, I work with a group of uh, artists, hackers, programmers uh, here and, and across the U.S. And uh, we're currently working on um, about half a dozen startups, side projects, and kind of product prototypes, and the. It's sort of like a, a long-term hackathon where we're trying to awesome. generate as many concepts and working with clients as closely as possible with the goal being um, most, I mean, what's fantastic about that approach is you're building up a portfolio and you're building up a set of software assets, but the long-term, the goal is to sort of bootstrap a, a VC fund where instead of raising capital and putting in a bunch of startups, you kind of help create these dozen or so startups and then as they start pulling in revenue and you exit those, you pull that back into a fund and then start and start it that way. So, yeah. I mean, that's, that's a heck of an experiment too, but, but like I was just saying, that's a, that's a time experiment that we're all committing to not necessarily uh, putting capital in like you would if you were starting a VC fund traditionally. Yeah. Um, yeah. So yeah, so that makes a huge difference. That's really cool. Yeah. No, that's, that's such a, you know, unique perspective on it. How did um, yeah, you start with that? How did that come about? Well, it came from, me being hyper distractible and, and unable to focus on a single project at a time, which is <laughs> standard. Um, I definitely don't recommend it. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> I don't recommend it, but I decided if I wasn't going to be able to get it under control, I should at least, uh, you know, utilize it and build support systems around it so that it, it does the most good that it can. Yeah. And I realized that looked something like partnering with uh, other really fantastic, talented people and, uh, empowering them and and helping create kind of these distributed sets of projects, and that way I get to bounce between project to project. Yeah. Um, but they're all still making forward progress, and we're we're learning a lot in the process. Yeah. No, that's it. I mean, I, I think that's very standard for a lot of entrepreneurs, where it's just it's very hard to focus on one thing, and you just kind of like, I got that itch, like you know, I need I need all these businesses. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> The fact that you've managed to turn that into a strength and really hone in is, is, is awesome. So, you know, I hope that goes really well for you. I'm, I'm looking forward to hearing how that goes over the next, you know, s s few months or a few years. Uh, I'm Same. We, we should know in about a year or so how that experiment turns out. So I'm, I'm interested in seeing where we get with it. Yeah. Um, <laughs> thank you, Grant. Thank you. I appreciate it. <laughs> yeah. No, awesome. Well, yeah, in a year's time, you know, I'd absolutely love, you know, get, come back on the show and we'd love to hear about, because, um, you know, the, the feedback we're hearing from the show is really well. So, I'll be very confident to say that we'll still be doing this in a year's time. Yeah. Um, so I'd love to hear, you know, just awesome. how it's all going. I'd love to so, come do an update. Yeah, that'd be great. Yeah, that'd Absolutely. be fun. So uh, how did you get into SaaS? That's, um, for, for everyone at home as well, what, what is SaaS? Because uh, we've had a few of our um, yeah, community members, uh, like Reese, for example, you know, they've been asking, oh, you know, can you get someone on the show that has like SaaS knowledge? Because they've got their, uh, their frameworks, but they'd love to know more. So I'd love to know how you got into it. Absolutely. So, um, SaaS is, is basically software as a service, but yep. uh, it, what's really, I think, it's, it's framed as a, as a product category, but what it really is is a, a business model category. Yep. And what's fantastic about it and what, it, what was, and, and, and the concept's been around for quite a while now, but what was revolutionary with it at the time was that for the first time you had the ability to generate um, revenue streams with virtually no cost, right? Like it, it software based. So virtually no unit cost. Yeah. Um, and because it's an ongoing, because it's a service that's being used on an ongoing basis, you can actually charge a recurring subscription for it. Yeah. And you know, you'd think this is how you would start with software to begin with, but it, it was such a software as a product was so novel that they sold, you know, one year licenses or they sold a one time fee usage for it. Yeah. Um, even though people would be using it continuously. Yeah. And so that what and that just all completely changes the level of predictability of your future cash flows. It changes, um, frankly, the level of stress yeah. and the level of management that goes into it. And so I immediately was attracted to that, especially since I, I love the idea of taking excess cash flow and investing it in those riskier things. Yeah, yeah, of course. You want that <laughs> you want that original stream to be really secure and, and a very mature stream of income and be very safe. And so that you can invest it in those side projects and those more experimental uh, projects. And so that, that was kind of what earned my fascination with it. 
Yeah, no, that's awesome. Yeah, that's really cool. Because I mean, I, it's it is. It's a case of it. It's a stable source of income, and once you've created it, you've got it. You know, and then you can reinvest and say updating it. But for the most part, you can reinvest in mm-hmm. other ventures. Um, you know, like when and and that's the thing. Like with the models having changed over time, it is now more of a you know monthly recurring revenue stream or or yearly. Um, and you know, when uh, Microsoft Office they changed it, so you got to get like a yearly update. I was like, son of a bitch, like. <laughs> yep. Yep. <laughs> Yeah, Microsoft finally caught up. Yeah. yeah, whereas it used to just be you just download it and or you know you'd have it and that's it you're done. But now it's just like, <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. But that's the thing: if you need the service, you're going to pay for it. So it's a fantastic revenue stream to have. Right. So, um, I'm, yeah, it's something mm-hmm. to, to definitely have. So yeah, it's um, it sounds like you know with that using that or utilizing it, I should say, in regards to you know creating a, a stable source of monthly revenue or yearly revenue, you then know exactly what to do with it next or, or what the next step is so you can reinvest that later so is that how you came about with a uh, story wars love the name by the way oh thank you thank you i my all credit to my co-founder for that uh he, he was the one that initially started that and i i came on a bit later after they had already uh incubated the the concept so um the the design and, and name on that are are it's beautiful and and all credit to the um to the founding team for that um so story war definitely piqued my interest because uh, as a kid, and I, I think probably a lot of entrepreneurs can relate to this as well. Uh, I was just, I was reading constantly. I was in the library up until the time we got internet and then I was on Wikipedia, right? Yeah. Um, Wikipedia sort of took over the, the library for, for a lot of people. Um, and I, I've noticed even my own attention span decreasing with the kind of explosion of social media, yeah. you know, deluge that everyone is taking in every day. Yep. Um, and, and so when I saw a service that was working on making reading and writing kind of competitive and engaging for kids, I realized um, how important that really was. And uh, I was very, very uh, excited to be contributing to that and, and, and something that, you know, has a lot of meaning for me, especially for my childhood, but in a way that I think can impact kids and students moving forward in a really important way. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Because, I mean, it's, it, as you said, you know, it's, it's something that our attention spans are shortening and it's almost like we're learning adult ADHD um, and I'm so guilty of that as well. Uh, whereas there's so much just right. going on. Absolutely. And to focus our attention now is super hard. So, I mean, I think that's why, for instance, as a podcast, not a video one, but your actual podcast that you listen to, that's why they're booming now at the moment because everyone wants to multitask. Absolutely. And if you're, say, traveling uh-huh. to your office or, or whatever else or you're doing something with your hands, you can listen to it. And yeah, now you're in the you, gym. Exactly, yeah. So your attention is now split, but you're utilizing that as best as possible. And I think it's just a thing about as well. It's, you know, we all feel like time is so precious um, in that regard. So we try to just multitask and juggle as much as we can. So. I'm so guilty of that. Absolutely. I've, I've learned adult ADHD. Oh, I, constantly. Yeah. It's, it's my biggest vice is multitasking, yep. hands down. Yeah, same. Uh, and I think by you being able to leverage that and having an incubator with you know, several startups in one is awesome because then you know, you're always just right. like your attention is looking at you know, five, ten different things all the time. So you're just like, yeah, perfect. Exactly. <laughs> no, <that's really> cool. <laughs> and it de-risks any, of, any one of them individually because of – you know, if one of them's doing well, then it kind of uh, helps. It can help support all the others in the ecosystem. Or if several, you know, if half of them fail, it's sort of the venture model again. You only need one or two of them to really pop in order to exactly. make up for the time invested in the others. And so, you know, it it helps. You know, it utilizes. You know, uh, the, you know, my attention span or lack yeah. thereof. But it, <laughs> you know, I think it it also has some really valuable. Uh, de-risking principles from a from a business model perspective I that make a huge difference yeah absolutely because all you need is really one to carry the rest and, and you're set so it really yeah d de- exactly um, yeah risk it which is awesome so amanda said uh, it's because entrepreneurs are all about growth so when we see the finish line we start planning what to do next yeah so we're always trying to just yep. yeah yeah 100 percent absolutely <laughs> okay, so multitasking yep. switch tasking studies show that we don't actually do all the things we do one thing, then switch to another, then another, etc. Yeah, yeah, makes sense for sure. <laughs> yeah, yeah, a hundred percent. Yeah, nice. So with uh, with Story Wars, so how how does that help engage, like help children uh, engage with, say, you know, reading and, and writing and that sort of thing? I'd love to know more about that because it's it's certainly something I think is going to be big in the future. Um, 
but uh, yeah, uh, before before I uh, jump in, I'd love to ha- hear uh, about what it is. Yeah, absolutely. So Story Wars uh, lets a a user write a sort of a chapter one to a story, so they can kind of write a premise or an intro to it, and then other students or other users can write um, chapter two, and multiple people submit their versions of it. And then users can vote on which one they like the best. That's cool. And so the one that gets the most votes gets added as chapter two, and then that repeats for chapter three. And so over the course of, of a few days or a couple of weeks or however long they want it, want it to be, you end up with a story that was sort of collaboratively and competitively written with the entire community yeah. uh, and with the entire community's input through voting. Yeah. And so it, it creates something that it, you know, it brings people together, but it also has that competitive element. And I think that that is, um, and it's, you know, it's consumable in bite-sized chunks because it's, it's chapter. So I think it's a, it's a great way to uh, inspire people to kind of push a little bit deeper uh, with the reading, because I think reading and writing are considered such passive activities and they're considered yeah. asocial activities, right? Um, because you can't do them, you know, by yourself and it's solitary. Exactly. Um, and so I think a lot, especially a lot of extroverted kids, uh, don't necessarily adapt super well to reading in all cases. And so I think by making it more social, making it more competitive, you bring in a whole other set of kids that, that otherwise are more interested by maybe video games or, or playing outside and, and which all those are, are super important as well and, and, um, and enjoyable, but it, it kind of creates the space for them to create and be expressive in the way that that suits their personality and, and we think that's really important yeah absolutely no that sounds fantastic well, it really does it, it basically creates balance in a way because yeah for those kids that like video games or like playing outside uh, adding in that competitive element is fantastic i think that's a great idea because then everyone's really you know chipping in um kind of like when you play um uh, cards against humanity you know there's that <laughs> <laughs> yeah for, absolutely for, for those that aren't into board games it really does add in that competitive element so it really you know brings everyone together so i think especially if you're in a classroom setting uh, and all the students are you know they have you know write the chapter and then it votes and then the next one and and then collectively reading that all together as a full book or whatever it is would be fantastic. So I, I think that's an awesome idea. Absolutely. Um, and we, we're in about 50 schools currently. And well, then, so we have like the, we have a private classroom side for teachers to use. And then we have sort of the public site where any, anyone can sign up and participate in the, in the massive public version. And, um, and so we got about 40,000 users on that side yep. and, uh, and we're in about 50 schools on the, on the other side. And we're, we're still sort of in, in beta in the sense that we're iterating the product with those schools. Um, but this year we're planning to push a lot, a lot harder. So we have some contacts with uh, Google Chrome store. We've been featured a few times with Google education yeah, nice. and we're hoping to roll out some really exciting things in the next few months. Um, and, and try to bring this to as many schools as possible and as many uh, users as possible to, um, to build, keep building that community. Yeah, that's fantastic. Because uh, Reese has had a question here. It's how did you create value for them when the uh, voter community hadn't scaled yet? Oh, that's a good question. Yeah. So, so that's an it, excellent question. Yeah. That, that's the hardest part of um, any, anytime you have user-generated content for your site. So Reddit ran into this problem. Quora ran into this problem. Um, and we solved it basically how they did. We, um, wrote a, like the founding team wrote a bunch of stories themselves yep. and started using it like between themselves and their friends and family. And, and so if you've got three or four people working on a project and they bring in their friends and their friends of friends, you can get 20 to 50 people kind of adding content. Cool. Maybe you, you get them to do that over a weekend or something, buy them a beer and, and kind of use the site. And what's great about that too is you're testing bugs the whole time, right? Exactly. Yeah. Um, before sort it of goes beta to testing big. the software. Yeah. Exactly. And and so at that point, at the very least, you have um, the sort of activity you'd see from maybe a hundred users. And at that point, you can take it to a small community and 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 recruit users. I think individually is really helpful there because they understand you're a startup. They understand it's a small community and, and you're starting at the ground floor. Yeah. Um, and it's time intensive, but it's really worth it if, if they're sold on the vision and they get involved um, at that level. Yeah. And so once, you, once you're recruiting people at that level and you kind of scale it up, and it really it doesn't take much for it to seem highly active. Because if you, if you go to our page, 
you know, we have editors picks for the top stories. Yeah. You only need 12 stories or 12 pieces of content to fill up a landing page and yeah. make it look really populated. Yeah. Nice. Um, so it ta- you'd be surprised how quickly you could build a, a decent content repository and Reddit did the same thing. They created like 50 different accounts and just posted content um, through all those accounts for a long time. Yeah. Um, and so it's, it's super, Oh yeah, definitely. I mean, that's the, that's the hardest part. Um, and I think it's, well, so it, it's time intensive. It can be yep. really hard to do if you're if you you just have to commit to like this is what it's going to be for three months at yeah. least. Yeah, exactly. Of seeding content, recruiting users manually, um, and if you're okay with that, then it's not too bad. But it and it can take longer than that depending on if you need to make product tweaks as well. So if you're doing product iterations while building that initial community, you're going to hit some setbacks, and that that process can take six to 12 months okay. at that point. But getting that right is absolutely crucial because until you do that, you can't scale at all. Exactly, yeah, because if, if you're you know integrating products and that sort of thing, you need to be able to make money from it, so. <laughs> absolutely. Yeah, no, that's awesome. And you know, that's the thing about forums as well. In the beginning, it's all about, you know, creating your own content as such with, you know, I guess, um, fake users or, or whatever. And it's just a case of once it gets, you know, up and running and everyone's then organically joining, that's, that's awesome. Yeah, absolutely. No, that's fantastic. Um, Amanda says, uh, uh, it sounds awesome, but I'm too much of a control freak to sort for that sort of thing. <laughs> <laughs> fair enough, fair enough. Oh, that's funny. I can appreciate that. Yeah, but no, that, that's awesome, Daniel. Because there's, there's certainly a lot of things, um, you know, anything to help engage, especially children with education, it, it's going to be a massive thing. Um, now, with... Um, so I'm not sure if that's your end or my end. There's just a bit of a static there. Hopefully it's just uh, the oh, that might be that might be mine. I am. I had to go. My apologies, real quick, to everybody. I had to go mobile in order to come into the stream, and I'm going to uh, grab a charger for my phone because <laughs> uh, I was anticipating my laptop being used, and so uh, that is set up with a charger. My phone, unfortunately, is <laughs> that not. I will... But yeah, the great thing about mobile, I can walk and continue, uh, continue talking. So <laughs> exactly, no, I really appreciate part. you coming on. So yeah, do whatever you got to do. Um, it's it's really Facebook's fault for not making it an easy user experience. <laughs> right, seriously, that was the. Oh yeah, by the way, enjoy the uh, the house, guys. I hope get the get the full tour. I love the wood fitting. See that. Uh... Oh, thank you. Uh, see the lovely Chicago snow. What we've been dealing with. Yeah. Last few weeks. That's cool. <laughs> yeah, no, over here in Adelaide, it's uh, it's been like thirty degree, uh, thirty degree, um, yeah, days like um, Celsius. So it's been very hot, uh, sunny. Oh, okay. Yeah, so no I'm snow. I'm used to Fahrenheit, so I was like, wow, you're almost, you're almost at Chicago's level. <laughs> yeah, I no think Celsius. You guys got cold. Yeah, no, it's uh, well, <laughs> when was that? I think it was that two or three years ago where we had. It was 10 days in a row or something like that. And it was 10 days in a row of 40 degree weather. And it was like the hottest 40 degree oh streak God. we've ever had. And Adelaide's even worse because where we are with the heat, the sun's a lot more intensive because the ozone layer is um, like basically just when it comes through, it's a lot more intense. So if you have, there you go. So 30 degrees Celsius is 86 degrees Fahrenheit. There you go. So yeah, imagine 40 That's wild, degrees. man. <laughs> yeah. <sighs> Oh my and God! If you're, do you have and do you have the humidity too? Yeah. Oh, we're lucky. One hundred and four in... degrees. Yeah. Wow. So yeah, ten days. Also, of that. props to Amanda with the conversions there. Yeah, thank you, Amanda. <laughs> I appreciate that. <laughs> yeah, uh, I know she's been on Google, but <laughs> but no, it's great. Yeah, <laughs> you, usually, if we if we need a fact, uh, all all of our uh, viewers will jump on Google for us. So it's it's awesome. So uh, thank That's you so awesome. much for doing that for us. <laughs> I love that. Yeah, I stole that from Gary V. <laughs> <laughs> oh, nice. Yeah, they they want to know something once, and they're like, "Look it up," and it worked out really well. So, thanks, Amanda. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. But yeah, it's, it was crazy. We had because um, if you're just say it's really hot in I don't know say um, I don't know Spain or, or wherever anywhere else in the world, even in the states, the the difference in the harshness of the sun is crazy. So the sun here is so much worse that you can get burnt to a crisp a lot quicker, um, even if the temperature is the same. Uh, and we're lucky that we don't have the humidity. Oh, wow. But if you go up to, say, Queensland, which is like with Australia, like South Australia's down here, uh, Queensland's right. you know, at the top there, uh, that gets quite humid as well. So then that's like your Bali and your, you know, your, your Thailand and that sort of thing. So 
So we're uh, that's how the South is in the U.S. It's yeah. it's so humid, and they've got the heat on top of that, and it's just. I'm I'm spoiled on the Chicago summers because uh, Lake Michigan keeps the uh, humidity off, and it uh, it makes a world of difference. <laughs> yeah, nice. <laughs> so I guess yeah, with Adelaide, we're very lucky. I mean, yes, the weather gets hot, but in regards to natural disasters and that sort of thing, we get very lucky in that regard. So no tsunamis or um, you know anything like that. <laughs> that is helpful. <laughs> no flooding. <laughs> the, the flooding is absolutely minimal. Like the a road will close for like half a day, and that's the end of it. <laughs> Oh, nice. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Not too bad. Not too bad. Yeah. Uh, so Reese has got another great question. So he's just wondering, in regards to um, like user conversion, so have you start off with like a freemium model or is it more so like a free trial or necessarily where you're at now, but when you do begin to scale, what do you think you'll, you'll begin to adopt over time? So our current pricing model is um, – it's been more flexible because they're mostly pilot programs with these schools, but yep. we treat it as a, uh, so it's a SAS model, uh, flat rate per month per classroom. And, and that's been currently what we've been playing with. Education is particularly dif- difficult for this kind of model because schools, sales cycles with schools are extremely difficult and their budgets are usually pretty tight. Yep. Teachers are willing to pay for software that's helpful, but I personally, I just don't love the idea of charging teachers um, for something that's effectively a professional tool. So we, we've of been course. doing that, yeah. but we're, we're playing with, we really want to play with getting away from that as quickly as possible. And at the same time, I, I don't think having ads on a site that's geared towards students is appropriate. And so that, that puts us in a place where we're, we're kind of boxed as a company. Um, but what, what's fun about that is it presents some really interesting opportunities. Um, and we've had a, a few discussions about this internally, and, and we're, we've talked to some external partners about this as well. But um, there's potential to, um, so what, so we're doing a couple things. One, we're, we're likely shifting to that, to a kind of a freemium model yep. on the education side. So make the service freely available, yep. but software, I mean, AI has gotten so incredible these days. We can do things like sentiment analysis, word check, um, all, we can run all sorts of analytics on the writing. And so for the teachers, the pitch is something like, instead of having to manually grade, um, these students, uh, student assignments, you can have them, you know, play, so to speak, on, on Story Wars. And then we analyze all of the writing for you and deliver that into a report. And then we also email that to the parent. So the parent is getting sort of oh, a wow. weekly update on their child's reading and writing progress and seeing if they're, you know, if the skill level is going up, going down, you know, is it's a steady progress, are they hitting any sort of humps, um, and that aspect of the service, what's great about that is being sort of geared that towards parents on the revenue side. Yeah. Um, and it's such a, and it becomes a tool then that the teacher is, is part of that loop, but the teacher is not expected to, to have to pay out of pocket because teachers, especially in the U.S., pay out of pocket for classroom supplies all the time. Yeah. And it, it's, it really is a strain on them. And so that's something that I, I, didn't, I don't think is scalable and I, and I didn't quite feel right ethically. Um, trying to push something like that. And so uh, by shifting it to the parents and making that uh, sort of a report that's available to them, it, it creates a, it basically takes the value that we're creating and finds another customer for it. And then we can share that with the broader ecosystem. So with the teachers, with schools and things like that. And that's almost a courtesy to the, to the schools and a tool for them to use. Yeah. Um, and, and so that, that's the approach that we're taking uh, in terms of free trial versus freemium. Um, as a, as a, so in a general, as a general rule, I think where free trial works super well is when the value that uh, the user is getting is immediate and also there's a cost to them taking that value elsewhere. So, for example, um, free trials work great for something like a CRM or like a customer relation management software because yep. if someone tries it out for two weeks, they're going to upload all their contacts into it, right? Yeah. And they're going to start placing emails through it. And so now they've got a set of emails and they've got a bunch of contacts they've uploaded and sure you can export the data. Right. Yeah. But when it, when the time rolls around, it's like, Hey, time to pay. It's, it's such at that point, it's less frustrating to ju- it, at that point, it would be more of a pain to get the data out, find a new service, yeah, they're committed. that whole process over again. <laughs> yeah, exactly. They're, they're committed at that point. Um, SAS, I don't think it works as well with, um, with models that don't have that component. So if it's a, uh, so like something like Netflix, I don't, I, I'm not sure it works great with because the users aren't getting 
um, as in, as invested at the beginning. So something like freemium is probably better. Have a, a really cheap option to get people started and then offer a bunch of perks and better features if they move up and then you focus on upselling them over time and continuing to provide that level of value yeah. uh, versus, and that, unless you can find, and obviously the best thing to do is to be able to do both of those, right? Yeah. Have some sort of commitment on the part of your users that they're putting forward that makes them not want to switch and keep being able to upsell and provide more value over time so that they not only, you not only retain them, but they're constantly moving um, their monthly fee up uh, because you're providing way more value. Yeah, exactly. Now that's it. And, and that's such a, a great point to make because you know, coming back to the whole commitment thing, once someone starts using something and they've got a taste for it and they've uploaded all their um, you know, information, it's just a pain in the ass to then transfer that to a different free or you know, free trial CRM. So you know, if you can essentially hook them within that first week or you know, seven, you know, two weeks or whatever it may be, whatever arbitrary number it is, once you've got them, then they're much likely to uh, continue. I use ClickFunnels as an example where you know, they offer a, a free trial um, and you can actually get used to it. You build your funnel, uh, and then from there, it's once they can see what they're getting, and it is an immediate return. Then they'll, you know, it's it's much more justified to start paying for it. Exactly, hundred percent. Yeah, because I, I used to. Have, oh, and, and, yeah. uh, oh, sorry. So we reset that. Uh, You've given them a great given idea. An idea for, for to emphasize commitment. Yeah, I'm glad. Awesome. That's that's super. Absolutely, that's brilliant. Awesome, awesome man. Awesome. And that, that's what today's for, really. So you know, Daniel, thanks. That's awesome. Like, thank you for coming on today because you know it's it's things like this where you know we're getting the live questions and it's helping you know inspire the um you know the listeners. So I really appreciate you coming on and um you know it's been I'm, you've had I'm some having awesome, a blast. Some yeah, awesome insight. Love yeah, this format for sure. Um, yeah, it's great. Like, and I think the fact that you're working in the educational space, like, to figure out figuring out how to then you know monetize that completely is going to it's going to go amazingly so until then it's more just a, that that kind of grind if you will of you know getting users on and and the fact that you know teachers right. you know they are they are limited and you don't want them spending out of their own pocket you know you want it to be covered by the schools or the government or whatever else so uh you know with the uh, brainstorming over time and i think that'd be really good so yeah i'm, I'm definitely looking forward 100%. to how it comes especially you know you said in the next 12 months you think it's going to be growing um, you know, you're going to hit that point. I'd absolutely love to hear how it's going along. So, you know, it's uh, going to be interesting times ahead. Agreed. I, I'm looking forward to it. I think 2018 is going to be a great year for, for a lot of people. Um, yeah. A lot of, a lot of friends, uh, a lot of people are, it seems like a lot of projects are coming to fruition with some people I've been keeping track with and a lot of, a lot of my projects are trying to gain traction. So, um, I, I think it'll be fun to kind of see how that goes and, uh, yeah, I'd love to keep people updated, and um, if if people have have questions or want more information or details, um, they're free to shoot me a friend request, shoot me a PM, um, and happy to to help out wherever I can. Yeah, awesome. Because yeah, this year, I mean, it tends to I find over time it kind of like goes up and down a bit in regards to you know the um, the the initiative that that goes around in regards to new projects coming, and obviously there's always new companies launching, but then there's just times when right. things boom uh, and for instance there was one uh, educational space um, piece of software I saw where it was to reading to children I think it's still in the beta stage but you would basically put the pen on the word um, or you'd read word and then uh, it would give sound effects so if you're reading about say lines in the jungle like a small book to a child and their lion roars in the background like that's massive you know so it's things like that this right. year in the educational, educational space that are really going to draw uh, your audience towards wanting to use, um, you know, SaaS. So I think, you know, with what you've got going, it's going to be fantastic with this new shift in technology or advancement as such. Uh, and spat, Absolutely. It cr yeah. creates a ton of opportunities across the board. Yeah, because, I mean, you've got one good idea, you know, whether it's, um, you know, this this one here in regards to Story Wars or something else, then it just builds up the entire industry as a whole. So then, um, you know, governing bodies and things like that are much more open to listening to new ideas in regards to the, uh, you know, the SaaS space for education. So I think it's going to uh, go really well for you. Well, thanks, man. I, I appreciate it. I'm, I'm excited to, to see where it goes. Yeah. Uh, so Reese has got another question here. Uh, Reese has been on fire with the questions today. So thanks, Reese. <laughs> um, uh, who are your first team hires uh, or do you plan on hiring for your first team? Okay, so when, um, so Daniel, when you were first starting out, uh, you said you've got a, um, you know, a, um, a co-founder there, but when did you feel it was time, if you have yet to, you know, get other 
people in on with you or are you still at that stage where you haven't yet got, um, you know, more, more, um, if you're employees or startup helpers, uh, yeah. Where are you at in that regard? So we have a, a couple of our initial people and I think how you make that decision. I, I, so I get, there's two considerations. I think the first one is more important than the second, but they're pretty related. The first one is, and, and everyone has, has this, but everyone has massive gaps in their skill set and in their experience and in their, their knowledge, hands yep. down. And you can't have a founding team large enough, really, to cover all of those comprehensively. And it's usually something hyper-technical, especially if we're talking software. Um, it's going to be something like, like systems-related, in my opinion, is super important. It's something that you can't hire too early for. But, that, but if you're also a founder that's a systems guy, then that's not the case. Um, so I think looking at the skills that you and your co-founder realistically have, and then the, the second piece of that is looking at what's going to be the biggest bottleneck to scaling and to growth. Yep. And, and if it's something, if there's a bottleneck to scaling or growth and it requires a skill that you or your co-founders don't have, then your goal is literally to make, just make enough money to hire that person okay. as quickly as you can. And you might want to bring them on as a partner at that point too, depending on how critical it is. Yep. But if you can kind of get to... Your founding team basically needs to be able to build an MVP. You need to be able to build the, a basic product that either a large, like a pilot client or a small group of beta customers will pay enough for so that you can pay your bills and hire a couple people. That's like your only go goal for the first like 12 to 18 months okay. is to do yeah. something like that. And once you're at that point, then in our case, it was, it's a systems guy. And so that's the, the first, the absolute number one thing that's needed. And then the second thing is on the opposite end of that, it is someone that has sales experience in the education market because there's a lot of nuances to how contracting goes and there's a lot of regulations around a lot of laws around having software in schools. And, you know, obviously we, we work to keep up with that, but the, the second person is someone that knows education inside and out as an industry and hopefully has some connections in that space. Yep. And so for us, that looked like the two biggest bottlenecks. Um, and then we can sort of fill in the gaps on everything else. And that would give you kind of that core team needed to, at that point, we could, at that point, the, the bottleneck after that would be like customer support and things like that. Um, and that's more of a standard, like once you have X number of users, you need Y number of support personnel. And so, and that's a little bit more straightforward. Yeah. Um, but the strategic okay. side, I think, comes down to founder skill set. Yeah. No, no, that's completely fair enough. All right. And for those that are, say, starting out, how would you, uh, you know, recommend that they do start from, say, scratch? Is it? Uh, you know, they, um, you know, look into a team or, or, you know, what's the first steps as such? So the, the hardest part with startups and this is, and where almost every single company fails is not having a market for their product. Yeah. Um, and so you can't spend too much time getting that right. Uh, and ideally that's what you spend all of your time on for the first like two years okay. is getting that right. And so and the other side, the other side of that is it's incredibly difficult to come up with a valuable product on the, on the whiteboard. Um, so rather than of brainstorming <laughs> in a traditional sense, yeah, right. I mean, yeah. because you're just, that's not where you live, right? Yeah. Um, that's not where people have problems. And so you're not in that headspace. Um, so I, so the most important part, and this is, you mentioned this on the intro where I was able to turn uh, a dishwashing job I had in college. Yeah. I wanted to ask business. you about that. Yeah. That's, that's really interesting. Yeah. Yeah. Well, it, it fits, it fits into that. Nice. Um, I, <laughs> so I was, I was just watching at, uh, well, at a few restaurants uh, throughout high school and college. And through that process, I, I kind of noticed a little bit about how the kitchen workflow worked and, and um, how they ordered uh, supplies. And, and I, you know, I was just very observant and liked to watch how it was managed. Um, and then from there, you kind of notice like, okay, well, this is kind of an inefficient way to do this. Or you, you can tell which parts of the process people get frustrated with. Okay. Yep. Uh, and this is something you can do dishwashing. You can do in the office. You can do it when you're, you know, you're buying something at a cafe. You can, you can be observing what systems look like and the processes uh, that people are going through in their businesses or in their daily life and look for those moments where the workflow doesn't make any sense. So, for example... Um, this restaurant had to place all of their orders by phone. They couldn't do it online. Okay. Um, they had to do a lot of logistics manually and they didn't really have a software solution to manage all of that. And so, and because I was an employee there, you know, I wasn't a sales pitch from an external person. I was able to go to the owner and say, you know, I noticed 
you, you have all these kind of workflow bottlenecks and I know you find it frustrating because I've heard you complain about it. <laughs> while the other employees complain yeah. about it. Yeah. Um, and, and so what if we put together, uh, you know, a software package and, and could automate some of that for you guys. And, and they were, they were into it. And, and so what's great about that is you have that initial customer before you even build it. That's cool. Um, and in almost any case, any problem that someone has, like if, like if that restaurant has that problem, like at least one other restaurant has it too, if not all of them to exactly. some extent, yeah. um, at least in similar markets and similar geography, like there, there's going to be more than one customer odds are. And, and so at that point you have a validated customer, you've built it and you've gotten paid before you've built it. And then you can turn around and take it to other clients as well. And, yeah. and you're not even having to, you're not cold calling at that point because you're doing it for an employer. So, yep. so looking, so I think step one, doing it from scratch is looking for those problems in your daily life. Um, looking for people that already trust you that would, would, you know, give you a shot to try and solve that problem for them and use that time and money to make the product something that actually fixes a problem. And then the scaling, like if you get the product right, you get the product market fit right, then the scaling is, you know, it's, it's a grind, but it's people kind of know how that works. Like, you know, you, you, you test marketing channels and you test partnerships and, and that's a process you can feel out. But if you don't have the right product going into that process, you can't save that. There's nothing you can do. Okay. And so yeah. focus on that, focus on the problem. Yeah. Yeah. Awesome. Okay. So if just say you do, you do focus on this problem and you're starting to create, you know, awesome software that's going to get around. How would you recommend in regards mm -hmm. to say a marketing perspective in say content creation or something like that, um, especially with Story Wars, how did you initially get it around? Was it all word of mouth in regards to, to say, cold emails or cold calls, or were you making like, um, I don't know, say like YouTube videos about the software, or um, yeah, how did you uh, yeah get that up and running? So all so all word of mouth initially. There, there's okay. sort of two parallel tracks in Story Wars. You have the you have the classroom side where the, the teachers are using, and that's almost a B two B model. Yep. Um, and then you've got the, the public version that, that are, that are public users that are, that are on the site. Yeah. Um, it started with that and it started with getting that kind of critical mass of stories so that it became self-sustaining and it kept itself full. And every time you came back, you know, every time you refresh the page, there's new content. Like that was the goal. Okay. Yeah. Um, and once we we're at, uh, once we were at that point, um, so I'm going to adjust this lighting a little <laughs> bit. We've, uh, the sun, the sun went down, sun went down while I was, uh, while I was sitting here. Um, oh, all good. Yeah. And so as the, um, sorry, so those were two, two very parallel tracks and the initial yeah. teachers that reached out to us actually found us through students already using the site. Okay. Um, so and, more and so or they would find us through, yeah, exactly. And so that was, and, and, and that still happens with like very, with absolutely no effort to um, reach out to teachers. We'll, you still get emails every week uh, asking right. to do a, um, yeah, exactly. Asking to, to check it out. And so I think that is a product of having, um, of getting the, the user experience right to the extent that we had a sustainable community base. So something like, so about 30% of our daily active users are on the site for more than two hours. Wow. That's um, massive. Which is, yeah. Yeah. So, so as far as attention, yeah, Facebook is something like their equivalent is something like 40 minutes, you know, if I'm remembering correctly. And so, and of course that's the nature of reading and writing, you know, reading takes time, writing takes a lot of time. So of that's course. why it's happening. But, yep. but that's one of the benefits of that, of that structure. Yeah. Um, and of course, because it's competitive, there's incentive to invite friends. So there's a viral component built into it. Um, and so once you hit sort of a, a critical mass of those initial users, then they're inviting their friends. So they get up votes on their stories. Um, and then eventually one of those students mentions it to a teacher or a teacher takes a look at it, uh, shoots us an email. And so there's sort of, the goal is creating kind of that ecosystem where, you know, a teacher will get a classroom using it. And so now we just gain 30 users. Those users will invite all of their friends. So you get another, so start with a classroom of 30 people. Yeah. You get 60, 70, 80 from their friends. If you have a proper invite system set up yep. and then they, all of their teachers hear about it through that same process. Um, and you just want that and it kind of bounces off of itself and, and it iterates on its own. Um, and, I, and so paid, obviously paid channels have a role in that once you're getting to scale and PR and I think content marketing for something like that's huge. Yeah. Well, what's great is the content marketing is the site, you know, all the, all the stories that people, we have tons of passive readers of the content, um, yeah. as well as the people who are actively participating. And so, 
um, that content sort of generates itself and all the users have an incentive to share that content. Yeah. Um, because yeah. they want to advertise themselves and it's sort of, it's like a social media site in that sense. So it's like advertising your Instagram. Um, and so all those factors. So you, I think it's, it's difficult to sit down and construct all that on paper, but I think once you have an idea of a product, you can start thinking about, okay, how do I, how do I get these people? How do I get influencers to share it? Like, so top down, and then how do you have people share it amongst themselves at those levels? And then that go back up into influencers at another point. And you can, those influencers can be media folks. It can be teachers. It can be anyone where you've got one person. You've got like a one-to-many relationship. You've got one teacher, 30 students. It's a really yeah. good opportunity to get something to spread viral, uh, exponentially, like Amanda said. Yeah, that's um, awesome. And, of course, and that sort of evolves naturally. But that's you can be thinking – you can be looking for those opportunities. It's hard to just make that happen. But of course. But you yeah. can look for little quirks of the market and then make little adjustments to take advantage of those things. Um, yeah. And that – and that's something you should be thinking about as you're also thinking about the product. Those are the, I would say those, those two things you keep in mind at the very beginning. Yeah, no, that's awesome. Daniel, that, that's fantastic. Right, thanks so much. Like this has been a, a fantastic chat. I've really enjoyed this. Uh, and I think there's been a lot of value awesome. there for, I, I uh, too. for yeah, everyone at home uh, that's, you know, perhaps looking to, that has their own software or they're looking to start up. So I think it's been fantastic. So everyone at home uh, that's listening within the niche entrepreneur community, um, we'd love to hear from you just to know that you got value from this. So if you're able to type in hashtag value, just so we do know that you did get some value from this. Or if you're on the replay later on, just so we know that you enjoyed this video so we know to make more podcasts in the future, if you're able to type hashtag Team R, let it offer replay, we'd absolutely love to hear from you because if, if we know that you're getting value from this, we'll keep doing it. Whereas if it's something that we feel that we can better invest our time elsewhere to help you, then we'll absolutely do that. So thanks so much for tuning in. Um, so yeah, Daniel, we're, yeah, how can everyone get in touch with you to say check out our Story Wars or or uh, you know anything else that you've got going on that you'd like to share with everyone today? Is it like all the links you've got? Drop them in below in the comments. I'd love to see those. Awesome. Um, but yeah, uh, how, I appreciate it. Yeah, absolutely. And, and you know, it's just a thank you for coming on and uh, sharing your time with us today. So, how can everyone get in touch with you for uh, all your services that you offer? Yeah. So feel free to um, shoot me a, a PM through here, or, or shoot me a friend request if you have any questions or you want to follow up on anything we talked about today. Yeah, uh, you can follow me on Twitter uh, at DT Lahan, uh, L E W H O N. Yep. I, I'm getting a little bit more active on there. Um, and if you want to check out Story Wars, if it's something that sounds like you'd be interested in, uh, either as a user or if you have a, a kid that, that likes reading and writing, or you'd like to introduce your your kid to a a fun way to read and write, uh, you can yep. check it out at StoryWars.net. Yep. Um, and I had a great time, man. Uh, great questions from the audience. Um, really great time. I appreciate being on. Yeah, no, thank you so much for coming on. It's, it's been an absolute blast. So, yeah, it's been fantastic. So, everyone at home, Daniel Lohan, uh, we really appreciate you coming on today. And uh, everyone at home, thank you for investing your time with us here today. So, uh, yeah, Daniel, we'll keep in touch. Uh, I definitely want to have you come back on. You know, if you said, if you think 12 months is kind of the time frame to, for everything to be booming, then uh, let's get you back on. Uh, Hopefully you've got enough time then when uh, you know it's, it's grown um, exponentially. <laughs> but uh, yeah. oh, I'm sure I'm sure it will absolutely. Yeah. All right, man. Well, yeah. Thank you so much for coming on. So uh, we'll stay in touch. And uh, everyone at home, thank you again for for tuning in with us today. Yeah.